Hello, and welcome to Lydia Nicole's Acting Smarter Now podcast. If you are an actor and you're wanting to level up your game, you have come to the right place. So buckle up and get ready because we've got some goodies for you right now. My first question is, what was the craziest choreography job you had? I guess the craziest choreography job I ever had was working with Whitney Houston because she couldn't, with that amazing voice and that amazing body, she didn't really move very well. So I had to keep pulling things down and down and down until I basically gave her snaps and that was it. And then she was very comfortable. So that was kind of the weirdest one. Everybody else picked up, everybody else I've worked with has always picked up quick, rather quick. Wow. My guest today is the iconic choreographer and dancer extraordinaire, Mr. Vincent Patterson. I love you, Vincent. First of all, I just want to say I, I just finished your book, Icons and Instincts. And it, oh my God, it was so good. You know, it's one thing when you know somebody, but you don't know all of them. Yeah. And so I was discovering you throughout the book. Oh. And I tell you, uh, there were parts of it that made me so angry. <laughs> and then at the end, it, it oh my God, my heart was breaking. Oh. So um, um, it, just, it just goes to show what a wonderful uh, book it is because there were parts that made me so emotional and made me want to, you know, yell and, and, and how some people treated you. If I could have done a drive by and beat the crap <laughs> out of them, I, well, that's my friend. What you, bah, bah, bah. But, uh, so, uh, but it, but wow. it was a wonderful journey. And I suggest if you are a fan of dance or of uh, pop, music or just theater. a culture just theater. A culture theater yeah. uh culture film acting dance this is a must have book and it's available i usually do this at the end but i would start it at the beginning you can get it on hardback paperback uh kindle or audio even though it's not vincent uh talking you through the book it still is entertaining so it's available on Amazon and I'm going to put the link for you below so you can get this book because it's really um, a history of, of our dance culture from the 80s on. And, and what is so great, Vincent, is that you really were at the forefront of uh, uh, the iconic videos that we all know. You know, starting with Michael Jackson, yeah, yeah, beat it, and uh, being in it, being one of the dancers in it, but going on to work with him. So uh, it's a wonderful ride. I want to start with your early life. You grew up in Pennsylvania. Your parents divorced um, at an early age, and you had to kind of be the man of the house. Yeah, yeah. My dad left when I was about thirteen ish and um we have i have three younger brothers and a younger sister my mom is only 19 years older than me so um you know it was very tough we were very poor and um yeah she had to go work and i had to kind of take over the household and become daddy and um it was difficult that you know because my brothers i don't have the best relationship with my brothers my sister's the youngest and we're very very close but you know i think my brothers resented the fact that i had to stand in and be the disciplinarian and you know give them the rules and the fight in the house kept being you're not my father you're not my father yeah i know i'm not your father and i wish i wasn't in this position but unfortunately i am so yeah but you know what experiences like that make you stronger and you know you never know and i'll tell you some of the some of the projects I've been involved with, I think that I that early education of being a kind of a young dad in a way gave me a lot of strength and a lot of backbone to handle a lot of the difficult situations that I found myself in throughout my career. So, you know, everything happens for a reason and everything is basically a blessing ultimately. 
what I love though, it, uh, as you tell the story in the book, as you start uh, sharing your your youth, um, your grandmothers. I loved uh, reading about the relationship that you had with your grandmothers and how they kind of molded you uh, in different ways. It was difficult because my house was quite violent and my father was a very violent man. And um, so my escape was my grandma's, you know, and uh, I had one grandmother who was just, you know, kind of nurtured the crazy artist in me as a young kid. And she had a room up in the back corner of her house filled with old costumes and dresses and things. She sewed a lot and which gave me like a theatrical uh, a back a trunk to be able to grab things out and dress my cousins up and put on shows and do all of that. And my other grandmother um, was from descended from Poland and um, she wanted to always go back to Europe and, and she was very poor. In fact, she had three little hair dryers in her front room for the Polish ladies on the street and she would do their hair and she saved up all of her pennies. And when I was 12, she, and I was kind of a precocious 12, um, she took me to Europe for two and a half months. The two of us just went all over Europe and it was absolutely phenomenal. It was the first time I saw dance. It was the first time I saw theater. I saw the sound of music in London. I went to the Follies Berger. I mean, in Paris, it, it, it was phenomenal. And these grandmothers both, thank, I'm so grateful for them. They both brought so many different things into my life and they both taught me so much about who I am and who I was going to be. Now, your father taught dance. Yes, my father was a, a, a social dance teacher, among other things. We were really quite poor and he had three different jobs. He sold insurance, he sold real estate, and he taught dance in the evenings. Um, he said uh, it was a very important that we did, never called it uh, ballroom dance. You had to call it social dance because he said there was this whole stigma of ballroom dance that he didn't teach was, you know, the form and the elegance and all of that. He just wanted to teach people what, how to dance comfortably when they went to a party, when they went to a wedding, when they went to a baptism or any other kind of celebration, backyard barbecue. Now, did you get to go and watch him teach dance? Yes, I did. When I was a young teenager, um, after he left the house, um, I did. I went with him a couple times to go to class with and watch him teach class. And he was a really good teacher, you know, and he had a great personality. And that's why it was so difficult because the person that he was with these people was not the person that he was around the house. So it was kind of difficult. And he had thousands and thousands of students over the years. He taught at a place called DuPont Country Club in Delaware. And he taught so long that he was teaching the grandchildren of the of, of students who had come in, uh, couples who had come in years and years before. So wow. he, he, he had a good reputation for being a teacher. There's one place in the book where you talk about him seeing your name uh, on the oh. Grammys and how it affected him because he saw his name. Yeah, it was the Academy Awards actually. Um, it was, uh, I've done a, created a piece for Madonna, a solo piece for Madonna to a song from Dick Tracy. And, um, and I had a big credit, I had a full card credit. It was like amazing. And, you know, I came home, I was so excited. I had it on, uh, you know, taped it or videotaped it and I ran it back and looked at it. I was so thrilled and the phone rang and it was my dad and my dad was an alcoholic. And, um, so he was kind of crying through his drinks and he said, oh my gosh, I'm, I, I can't believe it. I'm just, I, I just can't believe it. And I said, look dad, he goes, you, you, you know, I, that credit that you had on that, on there, do you, you know how many, there was like a billion people or something saw that show. And I said, wow. And he said, you know what that means? And I said, what dad? He goes, a million people saw my, a billion people saw my name up there. And I thought, oh God, dad, come on, you know, <laughs> you named me after you. Is this why, you, you know, it, anyway. But that was, that was, uh, the that probably was his big moment in life that he got to see his name yeah you know that when i when i read that 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 uh touched me i i i know how it affected you but it touched me because when i was um 
early on in my acting, I I added my mother's last name. Oh. Uh, her last name was Kamisyan. Uh -huh. So I did it for a year so she could see her name oh. on TV or whatever. Oh. So she could see it because I learned almost towards the end of her life that she wanted to be an actor. Oh my God. And, and so your childhood, there's a lot of similarities to our childhood. I, I had to be the oldest. I wasn't the oldest one in the house, but I became the oldest one in the house that had to take care of my siblings and they would uh, gang up and beat me up and <laughs> <laughs> I have to get the broom. I mean, it, and it was a violent home and we had alcohol and drugs and prostitution oh. and all that stuff. Oh, but but uh, being able to give her the name, her name that oh. she could see it, I thought was the best gift I could ever give her because it was something that she was never able to attain. And so here she got to see her name. So when, when you uh, spoke about your dad, even though he wasn't kind and he didn't live up to father and all of that, I got that little, that was a huge moment so yeah. i i just it, it affected me in a in a way that it was like you know that's the thing about your story right it will affect people in many different ways it's like dance you know yeah. you 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 choreograph a dance but everybody takes away something different absolutely absolutely i i want to talk about how did you know you wanted to be in the arts as a kid well i think that it started by wanting needing an escape you know, it was very difficult in my home. So when I got into eighth grade and ninth grade, I moved over to junior high and I started to do extracurricular activities. And the one that I fell in love with was the theater. And so I really enjoyed it. And I realized I had an aptitude for it. And I wound up being the lead in all of the high school and junior high school plays. And um, when I started to work to earn a little money for myself, uh, I went to a small little theater called Hedgerow Theater that's several miles away from my home. And I would earn money by working at the Dairy Queen. And I would use that money in the summer to take acting classes at Hedgerow Theater. And that was kind of the beginning of it all. I just fell in love with the whole idea of it. And maybe I guess it was a form of escapism to be able to be step into another character's life and, and kind of commit myself to that for a period of time and it it relieved me from a lot of the pressure and the difficulties that happened at my home so and yeah. what got you to los angeles oh my god that's a long story well i'll, I'll kind of well you just <laughs> share you go ahead and share <laughs> uh, I'll make that brief but uh, well i went to dickinson college in carlisle pennsylvania and i thought i was going to become a lawyer i got full scholarships to go um both financial aid and also scholastically. I did really well in high school. I committed myself because I knew I wanted to go to college and nobody else in my family had. My dad did, but that was a long, that was a long time ago and it was almost dismissed as, I don't know, an excuse. He went on the GI Bill. But, um, so I knew I had to work hard. I had worked my butt off if I wanted to get high marks to be able to get scholarships and I did. And so I thought, okay, Dickinson was attached to a uh, law school and um, graduate law school. And I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to become a lawyer because I can use my theatrical talent and I can make a lot of money. Well, that was my idea. That was my goal. But, you know, I mean, after like a month at Dickinson and there was an audition for the theater, of course, I went to audition and I got a really good role and freshmen weren't supposed to audition. And they never got roles. And so I just started getting involved with the group there. They were called the Mermaid Players. I absolutely adored my time in the theater. Um, they didn't have a theater major at the time. They had all kinds of theater classes, but no theater major. And I really wanted to graduate with a degree in theater. And I talk about that in the book. But the one thing I did have the opportunity to do was the, uh, my theatrical, uh, my, my theater teacher, David Brubaker at the time, uh, ran the department and he said to me, you know, Vincent, why don't you come up here in the summer and you and I will put a program together and it will be an independent major 
uh, and we'll take all these different classes from not only what we teach here in the theater department, but I'll go around with you and we'll talk to the teacher that teaches German theater and Spanish theater and Italian theater, and we'll ask them if they'll teach it in English. And they did. And so wow. I got a degree in theater arts and dramatic literature. Wow. And that was fantastic. I got out of there. I got a job working. Well, I did a lot of odd jobs, but at the time I was both driving a high school bus uh, for a local high school, a big bus, like 850 to 100 passengers. It was huge. I had never driven a bus or a stick shift. I learned how to drive <laughs> a stick shift on the damn bus. I got a great role um, working at Society Hill Playhouse in a film, in a play by Jean Genet called The Screams. And you know, I ended it in January and it was freezing cold as always back there. And I had said my whole life, ever since I was a little kid, when I grow up, I'm going to move to California. And everybody laughed at me because nobody I knew had ever left the area. I mean, never, ever, ever. But I, a, a dear friend of mine, she had a car and she wanted to move. So we got in the car and we started traveling and we went, stopped in little places along the south because I knew I wanted to be someplace warm. And finally, we stopped in Tucson, Arizona. I had a teacher who worked there and some friends there. And I stopped and my friend Karen, who with whom I drove across, stayed for a little while and then moved to Colorado. But I stayed in Tucson for five years. And that was where I started dancing. What prompted you to say, I mean, Tucson of all places, I'm going to start dancing here? <laughs> well, this is the thing. We know that my father was a, a, a social dance teacher, and I learned some all the basic steps of all the basic dances from him. So I couldn't get a job anywhere, you know? I mean, I, I applied it. The, I, nobody was hiring an actor in Tucson. And I even went to the 7-Eleven, and when I applied, they said, have you ever tried marijuana? And look, I was a hippie. And I said, <laughs> yes, of course, you know? And so I didn't get that gig. So. Near my home was an Arthur Murray dance studio. And I thought, let me go and talk to those people. So I went and talked to them. And here I was, a charming young man. And um, they hired me right away. And I, so I spent, you know, about a year, I think I worked there, um, basically dancing with um, elderly, wealthy ladies with lots of turquoise jewelry and lots of powder and perfume. And... Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> but on my way to work, I would uh, I would pass this little dance studio called the Tucson Dance Gallery, run by a woman named Stephanie Stivers. And I would hear this ballet music, and I would pass it by and pass it by and pass it by. And one day I stuck my head in, and she said, can I help you? I said, well, you know what? Do you have dance, all kinds of dance classes here? It was a ballet class with young girls. And she said, well, we don't really have adult beginning classes, but, you know, if you want, you can take with the girls and they, 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 you know, it's anywhere from 10 to 16 years old. And I said, well, I've never taken any dance in my life. I said, I, theater I studied, but never dance. And uh, she said, well, why don't you come on in and try it? So next day I came back and I tried it and I kind of thought it was really fun. And I had never been physical because I'd always been in the theater. So I was a theater mole. And I fell in love with the ballet. It was just so exciting. And, you know, to feel those endorphins going through my body was phenomenal to me. And also the other fun thing was that because I had theatrical training and I worked from the inside out as an actor, um, I went to the library and I put books out on like Noriel, specifically Noriel, and I would look at all the different roles he played. So I would go to a ballet class and I would say, okay, Vincent, today you're going to be Prince Igor, blah, blah, whatever. And I would take on that character. So by taking on that character, I was able to understand the complexity of the ballet. And the other part that was fun was because I was already an adult, all the little girls were saying, could you lift me? Could you lift me? <laughs> so, you know, I was lifting them. And, and then finally what happened was because there was such a paucity of male dancers in Tucson, and surprisingly enough, there were a lot of small little dance companies that I was invited by several dance companies to join them. And they said, you can take free dance classes, and if we make any money, we'll give you $50 or whatever we get for the performance. And 
if you'll dance with our company. So I danced with two different companies, three different companies, actually. Um, I'm sure I was horrible. I must have been horrible, but I was cute and I was male and that's what they needed. You, know? you were important to the, to the company. <laughs> you were vital. <laughs> I was vital to the that's community. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's and right. So that's kind of how I got into the dance thing. And so what made you decide to go to L.A.? Um, well, I had gone back and forth to L.A. a couple of times and taken some classes. Oh, um, OK. Yeah. I, I was living with uh, with a man for the first time in my life. It was a really incredibly beautiful, positive relationship, very supportive. And so he and I would drive out here every once in a while to L.A. and I would take from Bill and Jackie, Landrum. So you met Bill and Jackie taking Before classes I, yeah. out in L.A. Oh, wow. Yeah. Before I even moved here, I was taking classes. And that's where I met my best friend, Susie Lonergan, too. And you're my best friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, you know, and Joe Tremaine, I would take classes from Joe Tremaine. And I. And how did you know, it's one thing to say, I'm going to, I'm going to California, but how did you know that these were the classes? What, you know, it's like, you're in a, you're in a big city. Los Angeles is nothing like Tucson. And there were so many classes out here and so much happening. How did you know that? those were the places you wanted to go well i asked some of the dancers in tucson and so and they had come to la back and forth so they, they basically recommended i said i wanted to take some really good jazz classes because there was no real jazz in la i mean in tucson and i thought i wanted to take some jazz so they recommended roland dupre dance studios on third which doesn't exist anymore yeah i used to take tap there oh so I went there and that's where I took from Bill and Jackie. And um, I basically took just from Bill and Jackie there. I think I took a class from Carol Connors maybe. Um, and then I started asking other students, who else should I take from, you know, when I come back? And they recommended um, Joe Tremaine and a woman who taught ballet named Sally Whalen. Um, and that's, that's kind of how it happened. And then I went back to Tucson and, a fortunate, unfortunate situation happened where my partner, Richard, was murdered in a very difficult situation. And I was, uh, I suddenly thought, okay, this is, this is a terrible thing and I don't really want to be here anymore. And so maybe it's time for me to move by myself again and, and start a new life. So that's what I did. I, I, I came out to LA. Wow. And Jackie and Bill became your family out here. Jackie and Bill and Susie. You started uh, to have a community out here. Yes, was, I did. Was this your first time really having that kind of community, that kind of family? Or did it start in Tucson? You know, where, where you bonded with other uh, dancers yeah. and you guys just kind of. Yeah, it certainly started in Tucson. I mean, I, I, I spent most of the last two years there with a company called City Dance Theater. And um, we created all of our own works and a lot of it was story theater in a way. And, and we would create pieces centered around local legends or situations like this. And it was great. And we became very good friends. And I'm still good friends with some of those people. Wow. Um, but being here, it was very easy to step into a family with uh, the Landrums and Susie Lonergan and Rick Arnett, who became our kind of family masseur. And um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a beautiful, beautiful time. And how did you connect with Michael Peters? Well, Michael Peters taught at Roland Dupre. So, but what happened first was I first knew Michael because we danced together. Uh, for uh, an amazing choreographer who unfortunately is no longer with us named Lester Wilson. And he was a... The African mighty Lester the Wilson. mighty Lester Wilson. <laughs> uh, African-American choreographer who came out from New York and brought a slew of the most phenomenal dancers I had ever seen in my life. Michelle Simmons, Lorraine Fields, Gary Chapman, and on and on and on. And so he hired me. I was kind of a funky white boy. And... Um, and uh, he hired me often, and Michael Peters was basically his principal male dancer. So Michael and I became friends through work, and then Michael started teaching and um, at Dupre. So I started to be his kind of assistant in class. 
then I got a gig. My first really good money making gig was traveling the world with Shirley MacLaine as one of her four dancers. And I made money for the first time in my life, you know. I mean, I was still paying back my college loan, but, you know, I, I, I was still making some money. So I proposed to Michael Peters why don't we see if we can hire the studio late at night during the week for a couple hours a night? And we, you pick some people, I'll pick some people. We'll all come in for free and give you the opportunity to choreograph because that's what he wanted to do. And that's what we did. And we did that for several months. And um, gosh, it, some of those dancers now are some of the most important teachers and dancers and in Los Angeles and, and, and they just changed so many things for so many people. And that's how I met Michael Peters. And, and yeah, we had a lot of wonderful, wonderful creative experiences. Wow. So once you got into LA, you, you were dancing immediately as far as you got into different, um, dance, uh, production numbers that were televised out of the award shows. I did a lot of TV. But it didn't happen right away. I moved in January and um, I auditioned for everything I could and I didn't get anything for nine months. And the truth was, I was down to $35 and I hadn't eaten in a couple of days. And a friend of mine took me to lunch and there was a sign that said, uh, look, waiters wanted. And I thought, okay, this sign is a sign. And um, I went to apply. They said, you have to come back at dinner time because that's when the manager's here. I went to take what I thought was my last dance class with Bill and Jackie because I was going to give it up. I, I said to myself, if I have to do anything else but dance, I'm going to give dance up. So I went to take my last class with Bill and Jackie. And the man who ran the studio, Coronet Studios on La Cienda, came up to the room and he said, is there a Vincent Patterson here? I mean, you have a phone call. I had no idea who could call me. Anyway, I got the phone call. It was a choreographer named Joe Bennett. He said, listen, um, I'm looking for one more guy for a TV special that I'm doing. And I got your name from Lester Wilson. And I come over and watch it in class for a little while. Now, Lester Wilson only knew me from class. He hadn't hired me yet. So Joe came over, watched me in class for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, told, took me outside and said, you got the gig. And that was my first gig. It was like a CB, CBS, some kind of CBS special. Um, but yeah, it was, it changed my life. Thank you, Joe Bennett. Thank you, Lester Wilson. One of your early dance pieces, you had to throw a pie at Lucille Ball. <laughs> okay. This is very funny because this is not in the book and I didn't find this until I, I, I did a, last year my book came out and I, I I was fortunate enough to do an evening at Book Soup on Sunset. And I read from my book and I told some, but prior to that, I had done some research. And yes, I'm going to tell the story a little bit first. So I was invited to dance in this television special with B. Arthur and Lucille Ball. And it was a, this was a closing number and all, there were about 20 men and we were all in pink top hats and tuxedos with tails and all of that. And at the end of the piece, Another dancer and myself had been selected to throw a pie, a cream pie from off camera. In, I was to throw it in Lucy's face. He was to throw it in B's face. Well, basically what happened was we had a week where we practiced throwing these things at a little circle on the wall. And you had to be like 10 feet of almost away from the wall, which is very difficult with a cream pie. There's not much in it. It's just kind of the, the whipped cream part. There's nothing, no substance. But I did my best, and so we get to shooting this number. Of course, it's the last number of the day, and everybody's freaking out because it's we're in overtime already. And we get down to the end, and both my friend and I look at each other and get the cue, and bam, we throw the pies. Well, he hit B. Arthur perfectly smack in the face. I didn't. I hit Lucy off on the side of her face. Not a good thing, Lydia. They came to me, well, now we have to take them both to hair and makeup and put them all through hair and makeup again. <laughs> I was so upset. Anyway, I went over on the side and I just kept practicing, practicing, practicing. So they came back We did the second half of the dance to my friend and I coming off stage. He got his pie, I got my pie, we were ready to go. 
I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, please let me nail Lucy. Please let me nail Lucy. And I did. <laughs> here's Lucy. Here's, she, here's Lucy in the pink. Here's me in the, in the dark red. Oh, my God. You got it. You got it. That's awesome. I have never seen that before. Isn't that hysterical? That is awesome. Oh, yes. my God. Anyway, I had to share that with you. Well, and what she said to you afterwards. Oh, well, I, I got into I got into the uh, elevator to go downstairs at the end after the, the show was over. And, and she got into the elevator with her husband. And I said, oh, Miss Ball, I said, I, I, I need to apologize. I'm so sorry. I said, I'm the man who, I'm the guy who put a pie at you and missed you. And she said, oh, honey, oh, listen, it's hard enough to throw a cream pie from off camera. But you know what's even harder? I said, what? And she said, throwing a pie at Lucy. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so sweet. That was so, so sweet. sweet. With that yes. gravelly voice from, I think, years of Chesterfield oh, or something. Man. You know? oh, yeah, my God. That, that, it must have been bittersweet. Oh. Here you are on set with Lucio Ball, and you're, it's like, the the tension, the panic, the oh god, upset. It it's like everything. Oh, I'm gonna die. I got it. <laughs> At the beginning, it was such an honor to be chosen. You know, I was like, oh great, great. And then when it came down to it, I thought, hey, I never even played <laughs> baseball before. You know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh my god, that's hilarious. You know, crazy, crazy. Um, how long was it before you booked? Beat It? Well, Beat It, I think, was in 83 or something like that. So I came here in 78. So five okay. years after I had been here. So I toured the world with Shirley MacLaine. I had done quite a few TV specials, uh, Academy Awards, Linda Carter, Cheryl Ladd, um, trying to think, just so many of those. You know, every, every beautiful female star on television had their own special. And I was fortunate to dance with most of them. I never really got to dance with Anne Margaret, but... Um, the other ones I did, and that was a joy. And but but I also was the um, a regular on Barbara Mandrell and the Mandrell Sisters, the first country artist to ever have a variety show. And um, my friend Scott Salmon was the choreographer, and he brought me in for the first piece that they ever used a choreographer for on the show. And all I had to do was be a mannequin in a window, standing there like this. And it was with Dolly Parton and Barbara Mandrell. And when they passed by, all I had did, Barbara looked at me first as the mannequin. And then they walked by and I went like this. <laughs> and, and the joke was Barbara looked back and I was looking in a different direction. Well, after we taped the whole thing, Barbara actually said, do you think that's too much choreography? <laughs> <laughs> that was the first show. After that, she started hiring dancers every week. And every week I was her partner. Wow. So it went for two years and I was her only partner. So for two years and I got fan mail. It was so much fun. And I met so many incredible country Western stars. Um, they were all so kind and sweet and very down to earth and really easy to talk to. Everybody from Dolly Parton to Roy Rogers and Dale Evans or Gosh, everybody you can think of who was a famous country western star was on that show. So it was wow. A, then after that um, was Beat It, and and Michael Peters got to be a choreographer for Beat It. But um, he told me, Vincent, I can't just hire you. They want to see you. Bob Giraldi's directing, and Michael Jackson wants to pick the dancers. And but you know, I this is when my acting paid off, Lydia. Um, I knew it was about gangs. I didn't know what it was about gangs, but I knew it was kind of about street guys. So I thought, okay, I'm an actor. I'm going to come as this character. So I came as looking very similar to the gang leader that I play in the short film. Um, all my friends, everywhere I looked around me, were there in those uh, milliskin, I think it was called, milliskin, skin tight, dance pants with leg warmers and tank tops of neon colors. And here I am looking like a, a real guy from the streets. I let my beard grow a little bit. I wore an earring. I greased my hair, you know. And I knew Michael Jackson couldn't take his eyes off of me. And I could dance well, especially Michael Peter's choreography. So 
I got the gig. Yeah. And yeah, that was the beginning of my 18 years with Michael Jackson. Yeah, 18 years. Would you say that was the job that shifted you? Well, I'll tell you, it was... Every, I think I, in one sense, yes. In one sense that it made the first step in my relationship with Michael Jackson and that relationship as it matured and I became a choreographer and a director for him, that changed my life. But I always try to collect as much information as I can from every project that I ever did, even as a dancer. I knew at some point I didn't want to dance forever. I wanted to be on the other side. I wanted to be a choreographer. I wanted to be actually go back to being a director. But here in LA, the process was you had to go to be a choreographer, then you could go to be a director. So I knew that I just wanted to pay attention. And, you know, working with Michael Peters was a great, great exercise for me in, in education of choreography. And also having great directors like Bob Giraldi, Joe Pitka, um, John Landis doing these short films for Michael Jackson. I mean, I was like a sponge, you know. I just hung out and learned as much as I possibly could about everything that happened on the set, knowing that I would want to do that. So in a way, you can say, yeah, Beat It was the first piece that really changed my life. But um, I think what happened for Beat It for me was that it gave me a lot more opportunities as a dancer without having to audition. That was one thing. But it also um, cemented my relationship with Michael Jackson because I was Michael Peters' assistant, which meant I spent a lot more t- a lot of time with Michael Jackson, one on one, kind of fi- fine tuning his work, answering questions for him. And he was so shy, he was so nervous around people. And and I'm a pretty affable guy, so we got along really, really well. And. He knew I didn't want anything from him. I was just doing my gig and having a great time. And I loved to laugh and he loved to laugh and Michael Peters loved to laugh. So it was a beautiful bonding. So in one way, yes, it was the first step to a different career that I had hoped to have, but didn't quite know that it was around the corner. What was the next big job? Was it with Madonna? Was that the next big video that kind of... Thriller. Oh, 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 okay. So it was Beat yeah. It and then Thriller. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I did, I did Beat It and Thriller. And again, I was Michael Peters' assistant in Thriller. And um, I was a zomb- dancing zombie yes. in it as well, yes. which further cemented my relationship with Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the next big, big thing that happened was he called me up and asked me to come to a recording studio around the corner here in Hollywood. And I did. And he played a little bit of a piece of music. He said, I don't have the words yet, uh, but here's the song. It, and it's called Smooth Criminal. And all I have is, Annie, are you okay? Annie, are you okay? Are you okay, Annie? Anyway, he played it for me many times, maybe five, six, seven times. And as I was leaving, he handed me a little cassette. I think maybe your audience will remember what those things are. But anyway, there's little cassettes. You put in a cassette player. And I said, well, Michael, what do you want me to do with this? And I said, you want me to dance in the film? And he said, no, 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 no. I want you to listen to the music. Let the music tell you what it wants to be. And then I want you to conceive what you think it should be. And and I want you to choreograph it and direct it. And I kind of took my chin off the floor and said, "Uh, okay, thank you. And went home and spent several days listening to it. And he called me back and said, well, come meet me. So I met met him and I had this concept of the way Sweet Criminal has evolved. And um, he said, great, let's do it. So that was kind of, I I mean, I started to put it together. And then what happened was that was at the sort of December of of the year. I can't remember what year it was, 85 or 6 or something like that. And um, then they decided to take Sweet Criminal and make it part of a movie, make it Moonwalk. So all of a sudden, it was a big DGA project, and they brought in the DGA director, Colin Childers, a very sweet man, very talented man. And so I didn't get to direct Smooth Criminal. But the beautiful thing about it for me was that I got to create it. I got to conceive it. I got to create moments for Michael that he continued with throughout his entire life, whether it was Band-Aids on his fingers or, or, or armbands. And I created the lean. You know, which is one of the most 
remembered iconic moves that anybody has seen in the last 40 years, you know, and, and he gave me the permission to do everything I wanted. And, and, and what he said to me, as did Madonna, and what more can we ask as an artist? They both said, all we want you to do is to create something fantastic that the world has never seen before. Now, come on, David. As an artist, you've got the money there. You've got the two biggest rock and roll music stars in the world. You've got the permission to do whatever you want to do. I was on top of the world. It, it was a dream come true. It, it, it was a dream come true. The only dark part that was attached to it was that um, Michael Jackson chose to use me rather than Michael Peters. And this created a, a big schism in Michael Peters and my relationship. And out of anger, he accused me of trying to take his jobs and things like that. And I never did that. It was a big surprise to me that Michael Jackson called me and all of that. But I knew that that was my destiny and I had to follow it. I'm also thinking, because as I was reading the book, knowing Michael, because I got to be around him, was he wasn't good with harsh people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know? And Michael Peters was a little, Michael, Michael a little Peters. ghetto. He was, he was, a, he was a little diva. He, <laughs> he was edgy. Let's, let's call yeah. him edgy. Let's, let's, let's call him edgy. Yeah. So he was edgy and yeah, you know, and he also, he also had a, an ego that sometimes was a little bigger than healthy. And, um, and I think that that was difficult for Michael Jackson. He, yeah. he liked quieter people. He liked, you know, people who were not necessarily there for just him, but. Well, there's know. a thing of knowing your place, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, a, it's an unspoken yeah. uh, thing. When yeah. you're dealing with superstars, they may be very sweet and quiet, but they're watching. So if you are upstaging them, you're not going to be there very long. Exactly. You know, that that's very, mo um, well, I don't want to say it's very Motown-esque, but, no, you know, Motown, yeah, but Motown was very big on protecting the artists. Yeah. So Michael came with that, you know, it's like, wait a minute, this guy may be good, but he's not protecting me. He's not yeah. looking after me. And you were, at, yeah. at least that, that was my interpretation uh, when I was reading it. Um, what I found interesting was here you had these two. There, there was nobody bigger than Michael Jackson and Madonna. And then you, then it's like you get the other side of the coin with Hal Prince and, and uh, Dana Ross. They say they want something different and unique that we've never had. Yeah. But uh, in the end, they didn't. No. Yeah. And yeah. how was that for you? Because it's like you're given carte blanche from the biggest people. Now you're going to some more big people. I mean, uh, Dana Ross was, she was a queen. Yeah. And oh. Hal Prince was the, the, king. The, the king of Broadway. Absolutely. And thinking you're going to get the same respect and treatment and, and consideration from in collaboration people. yes yeah it was quite difficult you know both of those situations were very very harsh and um and i didn't understand them you know i didn't understand the reason why because both of them said to me you know we want something new we want diana ross i i, I want you to change my image i want you to make me i want you to bring me up to up to the times you know and how prince you know I'm tired of Broadway. I'm tired of the people who work on Broadway. I want some new blood. Broadway needs new blood. That's what he kept saying. Well, I think what he meant was he wanted my blood. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, but I yeah. think with them, they were older and established and fearful. And fearful. It's Full one fear. thing. It's one thing to say I want something new, but when you've made all your bread and butter in a certain way. And you yes. see this, not just, I mean, you see this with so many established oh. artists, you see them there, they are, um, you know, they're at the top of their game Yeah. and the fear, you know, they want to change, but the fear, if I do, how will, how will I get treated? 
that that reinvention um they're they're not courageous enough to take that next reinvention step because they're saying i want you to reinvent me vincent i want you to give me a makeover yeah and then you're like here are my palettes let's go but i tried so hard to work within the structures of a broadway and also create for Diana. I mean, I had worked with other women as well. I mean, I'd worked with so many women. That was that was a wonderful thing for me. You know, I got to work with Olivia Newton John and I got to work with Sheena Easton and so, so many people, you know, gorgeous people. And and Joni were, Mitchell. And I, Joni I, Mitchell. And Joni, you know? I can't believe you worked with Joni Mitchell. I was Joni like, Mitchell. I did not know this. Yeah, Joni Mitchell. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, amazing, just amazing situations. So, you know, Diana was a, 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 a an idol of mine. I mean, I had seen her, I, I loved her work. You know, I told you we were poor, but my mom and her boyfriend at the time, when I was a senior, we were graduating. She gave me for my, uh, my graduation present was I could take my girlfriend to this place called the Latin Casino in New Jersey to see Diana Ross and the Supremes. And, you know, it was like the biggest joy of my life, you know. So I was so honored when Diana called me and flew me to Connecticut to her home at that time and said she had seen Michael Jackson's show that I had directed and choreographed the bad tour, his first tour, solo tour, and that she had spoken to Michael and, you know, and she knew I was the one to give her this fresh image. And I thought that the show that I created for her was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, it combined theatrics, it combined disco, it went from disco to classics and everything in between. And but I thought what was interesting, there were two things that that you wrote that I thought was really revealing. She was MIA and MIA. she were doing the stuff. So there couldn't be a collaboration because no. she was she was she said you do it yeah. and then when you did it you got slapped I'm not oh, yeah. not 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 physically, physically but, but you got slapped down yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely in a phone call in a phone call again she wasn't even present you know no she said you put it together this is what she said to me literally her words were you put it all together my musical director will be there and my background singers are there. They'll be part of the dancers and um, my manager will be there. Everybody will be around and everybody was freaking out positively about what I was creating. They were so in love with it. They were like, oh my God, this is exactly what she needs, you know? And I think she was somewhere in Europe redoing her teeth or something. I can't remember exactly, but she was an MIA. And then when I sent her some tape, and she looked at it and she just didn't like anything that was going on. And she, you know, and everybody was very upset. All of the people that worked for her because they were so excited. They said, oh my God, it feels so refreshing to play these songs in the tempo in which they were originally created because in Vegas, she had sped up all of the songs that we knew and loved, you know? So her team was behind me a hundred percent and they were as heartbroken as I was in the dancers world. And we, all got the Miss Ross axe. <laughs> and then with Hal Prince. But with her, I I, I could see fear, 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 fear. In, mm. in, when I was reading, it was like, she's not even there. So that oh, that's yeah. already a, dis, there's a disconnect already. It's oh, yeah. like, you, I want you to, I want you to reinvent me, but I'm not going to participate. Uh, yeah, and, you, exactly. But with Hal Prince, I thought his stuff was, as vicious as Shirley MacLaine. I thought was, that was, it was a little cruel. They were cruel people, and which was uh, sad. Um, anyway, go ahead, you, you share. No, no, story. no, I was, I was going to use that word cruel as well. You know, I mean, I kept looking when I was creating the choreography for Kiss of the Spider Woman and I got a Tony nomination for it. So, I mean, everybody didn't dislike it. Um, I kept saying, what am I doing wrong? What What's not working for you? What's not working? And I never got any answers, you know. My, my answers were, where's my kick line? Where's the kick line? Where's the show-stopping kick line? 
well, I thought he wanted new blood on Broadway. You know, that's the way I looked at it. Well, one of the most typical old blood situations on Broadway is a kick line, you know, so I wasn't about to create a kick line. And I never in my career had up to that point, I had never been asked to do something for applause. I was just asked to do something unique and good and original. And, you know, so I wasn't, maybe I didn't even know how to do something for applause because that's not the way I worked as a, an actor or a choreographer or a director. I, I never went after an emotion, you know. I always went for truth. His, so, his line was kick line. Uh, Diana was, where are my hits? Where are my hits? <laughs> I know. One wanted her kick line and one wanted her hits, you know. Yeah. And I said, to, I said to Diana, I said, are you kidding me? I said, all of your songs are hits. They might not be the ones that you sing all the time, but I've been a fan of yours for years. And these are, I can sing every lyric to you, you know? So yeah, it was, you know, Lydia, I've been so fortunate that I've done so much and I've been so grateful. And in so many ways, you know, as a choreographer and a director and a dancer and even as an actor for a while, but, um, Every, the the ratio of difficult people versus the unbelievably positive people that I've had the opportunity to play with has been so minute that they they deserved a mention because I thought people need to know that everything wasn't perfect throughout my career. And I that's what I loved blocks. about the book. Oh. Was we get to we get to go through your difficult, your challenges, your failure. Like uh, when you talk about not having work for was it nine months that no one was calling you? You had been working, 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 and all of a sudden it stopped. Nothing. Nothing. And you you hit the panic button, so to speak. I did. I, you know, I. <clears throat> I had to write about my attempted suicide in the book because I think that people look at someone successful like me from the outside and they just think that, oh, you had a perfect life your whole time and you probably grew up spoiled and privileged and, you know, and everything fell into place so easily for you and all of this. And, um, and that wasn't true. So I needed to set the record straight, so to speak. But what were you... Okay, so so you go get a gun because things are not working. You go to get a gun and you you go check in at a, a hotel room. Santa Barbara. Of what do you like? What is going through your mind? Like, oh, I'm gonna go to Santa Barbara now and kill myself, and then and then what? Well, um, I don't know, you know, but I I got obsessed with the with Hollywood or something, you know, with a, with the concept that I wasn't worth anything unless I was being creative, unless I was being creative on a big scale, you know, that I didn't have any worth in the world, that I didn't have, there was nothing worth being here for because nobody wanted me, you know, and I was in a relationship that wasn't really it was a nice relationship but it wasn't all that supportive in a way and um it wasn't and I, feeding it wasn't feeding you no not in a way that i needed at that desperate time and i i wasn't rational obviously you know i mean people who are in that state are not in their rational mind and you know i was surprised that i bought the gun i've always been anti-guns and um i bought that gun and i didn't even tell my, anybody, my best friends or anybody, any that this was going on. And it just continued to get darker and darker and darker and darker for me mentally. And I did. I, I, I drove up to Santa Barbara. I remember the hotel. I remember the room. I can see it in my heart. You know, and, and I went in there and I, I just kind of said a little prayer, I think. And then I put the gun in my mouth and... Honestly, God, I was just ready to do it in the And I run. love how God intervened in the funniest way. The just phone. in the funniest way. It was like Monty <laughs> Python. Monty <laughs> Python. It was like the phone rang and I, I, I wasn't going to pick it up. And it rang and it rang and I picked it up. And the lady said, do you want some ice in your room? And I said, what? What? She said, do you want me to bring some ice in your room? 
I just thought <laughs> we need is... to cut. We need to cool you down. You're you are too hot. <laughs> you are too hot. <laughs> they can feel it. They can feel it at the front desk. Oh, let's get him some ice. <laughs> Oh my God. Oh I my thought God. that was so delicious how God just intervened because that was God. You said a prayer, God answered you. Oh, yeah. You know, He was like, okay, Vincent, you, oh, you yeah. didn't, I didn't bring you out of your childhood, which yeah. was way worse than this. But yeah. you're to act out now. Yeah. You know, we well, can't have the, that. This is, the, this is the pitfall of the entertainment business, you know, is that you, you you get into this beautiful routine if you're fortunate enough to be working, 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 and working in a way that your work is visible and seen by billions of people. And then all of a sudden something switches somewhere and it's not has nothing to do with you or what you've done, but I don't know what changed. And I stopped being asked to do anything. And um I just fell apart because I lost my own sense of self-worth and I only saw myself as being valuable when I was being creative on a big scale. And, um, and it's a terrible pitfall. And you see it happening with so many um, celebrities um, where they turn to drugs, major drugs. I'm not talking about marijuana, I'm talking about major drugs. And, you know, or, or, or this obsession with being past the point of necessarily needing to go out and do another tour, but they can't live without the love and screaming and the adulation, and the yeah. adulation of, of these billions of fans. They don't know how to live without it. You know, even though they might have beautiful home lives, children, all of that, there's something that takes over and somehow makes them believe that their worth comes as they're as their art as being yeah, those are demons oh, those are yeah. demons because yeah. after your breakdown you had an incredible breakthrough or at least that's what i saw was you then not it was like your creative your creativity went global in a whole nother way like out out away from pop music and it was like, all right, now we're going to take you to the other side of the world. And now you're going to, you're going to do art from a genius point of view. Opera. Yeah. <laughs> Opera. Yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was, you know, and, and working on Dancer Cabaret. in the Dark and Dancer Cabaret. In the dark. And Cabaret. And it was like so different from the first half of your career. Yeah. Absolutely. To be able to just go into um, a whole, all new territory, but your your courageousness to just dive in and your willingness to just allow process to be, I thought, was amazing. Oh, I, I mean, and, and and I mean that is part of your legacy. I, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to put stuff on you, but. But mm. as I was reading it, to me, that's part of your legacy to uh, just ingest it and let it tell you. It's like what Michael said to you, let right. the music tell you. Yeah. And it's almost like you live by that. I do. I do. I absolutely do. I think those are some of the most important words that were ever spoken to me. You know? And what an incredible lesson rather than imposing, at least for me as an artist, every different artist work in every way imaginable. But for me, those were the words that really led to the way I create, you know, whether it has something, whether what I'm creating is musical or non-musical, it doesn't matter. Um, there's still music in dialogue and there's music in, in the tempo of scenes, whether it, you know, and, and, and I let it always talk to me first and then when I got the inspiration, I started to see pictures in my head. Then I know it's time to move this on and share these images with those people with whom I'm working. You talk about visualization and you talk about visualization a lot in the book. Visualization, also manifestation. Uh, you had an accident with your finger that it was severed and you, visual, you, you manifested your, your finger to come back. I did. I did. Which... Uh, amazing. 
this amazing thing. Yeah. amazing it's a, little, a little bit shorter you can see but it was supposed to be gone from there so 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 let's talk about visualization because i'm i'm really big into uh the mindset how important mindset is and you got to visualize and and how you would put stuff on your refrigerator and i still have things on the refrigerator you know i right now i have a, a dear friend who um Jacob Jonas, who's a choreographer in Los Angeles, has his own company, and he had cancer last year. And um, so on a, our, my refrigerator for my husband and I to walk by every day. Renee. 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 <laughs> we love you, Renee. <laughs> it says, Jacob is cancer free. And we just, I put that on the refrigerator, and every time we go by, we look at it. And I believe that that goes into your mind, and it floats out into the ether world or whatever, and you're putting that positive energy out there. You know, I have another dear friend. He's in his late seventies. He has terrible, terrible back problems. He's one of the sweetest men in the world. And right there on, right on the refrigerator, it says the same. Dennis's back is in perfect health. I mean, I believe this almost every Where person did you get it from? Cause it started a long time ago. Where did you get it? It started with the finger. When I lost, when I when I lost part of the finger in a Nautilus machine chain, I was. But a, but but had you hurt someone? No. Okay. No. What happened was after I did it and I decided, I told the doctor, I'm going to heal myself. You're not going to cut my finger off. I'm going to heal it. I then asked a bunch of friends if they knew psychics or healers in Los Angeles, and I went around and I visited five different people all who were healers or psychics or whatever. And I asked them for techniques and they gave me techniques. And one of the techniques was visualization. And, um, you know, and, and the first time, I, the first time I had encountered it though, I'll tell you on a very small scale, I was at the American dance festival in 76. I was a dancer and I was supposed to go on. I was in a performance. I had a really good dancing role in one of the pieces. And that morning, a, a strep throat was going around the campus. And I hadn't gotten it, but the morning of the performance, I got it. And I went to the infirmary and they gave me some penicillin and I went back. But there was a woman, uh, Louise Hay, who was teaching. Uh, she was there and she was teaching and she was talking about philosophies and all this kind of stuff. And I went and I spoke to her and I said, listen, can I, is there anything you can teach me about what I could maybe do myself to help heal myself? And she said, do you know anything about visualization? I said, no, I don't. She said, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to lie down in your room, find a place where the sun is shining on your throat. And I want you to close your eyes. And first I want you to centralize the pain that you're feeling. Find out where the scratchiest, most difficult pain is coming from in your throat. Then what I want you to do is think that that pain is surrounded by an ice cube. And when the sun is shining on your neck, I want you to imagine, visualize that the ice cube is melting away. At the end of the day, I went back to the infirmary because I had no cough, I had no fever, I had nothing. And they said, you don't seem to have strep throat any. How did this happen? You had one dose of penicillin. I said, I started to tell them a little bit and I got it. That's how it began. And that's how it began. And then the second time that it ever came into my life was when I ripped off half of my finger. And, you know, I started to visualize my hand uh, in perfect shape. And I would ask, there was way pre-social media. So I would write or call my friends around the world. And I said to all of them, um, when it's noon, your time, wherever you are, if you could you look at your left hand ring finger and just imagine quickly in your head, say Vincent's finger is as perfect as my finger and I think that's what did it you know that collective consciousness that collective consciousness yeah I believe in visualization uh when I first moved out here uh, do you remember the Bodhi tree oh sure so I went to the Bodhi tree and I picked up a, a little book called visualization by Shakti Gwain and I and I remember reading that, and it 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 made such a impression on me. I had already do, I had already been doing vision boards from the time I was a kid, not wow. knowing 
that was vision boards, but I no. would I would put pictures of of people I wanted to meet, which ushered me into a radio station at 13. I got to be there for five years. I met Michael Jackson, uh, Marvin Gaye. I met all these people. Um, right. I, I got to, and it was, and I know it was from visualizing because for me, that was part of my escape from the childhood and the, the craziness and all the drama and just turbulence. But it was the visualizing like i would i would literally see myself uh talking to these people and and being friends with these people and and when i was 17 um well i got to meet michael at 16 but at 17 he came to do the whiz in new york and so i got to go to uh um because i was working at the radio station got to go to the whiz to see them shoot and then he would give me little notes. He would send me little notes of records that he wanted. So I would get him like, you know, I would get him collections of records and he would have a uh, a courier come and pick them up. And I got to go to the, um, the, uh, um, the rap party for the Wiz. It was oh, at a, cool. uh, yeah, it was at a, a Chinese restaurant. Uh -huh. And it was the first, I was 17. It was the first time I had ever been around an entourage of someone famous and hearing the negative conversation of these people who were leeching off of Michael. So I'm sitting there, we're waiting for him to come. I'm sitting there and, and they're all just talking badly about him. And I'm sitting there. First of all, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. I'm not having it. I'm like, wait a minute, you grown ass folk are, are you're here because of him. And yeah. so they were talking about how bad his hair was. He didn't comb his oh. hair, blah, blah, blah. So I, so when he walked in, cause he had the Afro, but it was all mashed in. So I, <laughs> I went up to him. I said, Michael, you got to pick. He said, yes. I said, go comb your hair, go oh. comb your hair. And he, <laughs> he looked at me like, like I had cursed his mother. Uh, he said, my hair's fine. And I looked at him, I said, okay, if you think so. And I walked away and he came back to me. He said, I don't know how to comb it. I said, come on, I'm going to show you how to comb it. Oh, and I went, oh. I took him in the men's bathroom and he was like, you can't come in here. I said, Michael, I can go anywhere I want. <laughs> and I went into the bathroom, started combing his hair where men would come in. He said, I didn't tell her to come. I said, I'm in here. You come back later. And I combed his hair. We walked back out to the table and those people did not know what to do with themselves. And, yeah. and I sat down and I was like this oh. and no one said anything. And I, oh, I just man. remember, I mean, I had some other some other oh. moments some other teachable moments with michael because i felt like he needed to be vocal at times oh. and 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 being a kid from the streets i was all about being vocal we're gonna <laughs> we are we are not having this michael and, and i would say that we're not having this michael this is not what we're doing and oh, so uh, but the visualization uh, it, and i don't know if it's because when you grow up in a volatile home that you in order to survive in order to get out alive you need to go into your imagination and pull from that and that's and, and as a kid i was always pulling uh from my imagination you know it, it, so so i just i just found it fascinating uh when you were uh just making little points about, you know, it was on my refrigerator and Glenn Close was on my refrigerator and so-and-so was on my refrigerator and how, how um, important that is for artists that we visualize, you know, and, and what I got from you and I want you to talk about this is the collaboration. First of all, you're such a gentleman when it comes to collaborating, you are so kind. I, I, I want to know how, cause you could have gone, you could have gone the, the Michael Peters way. What was it in you, um, to be so gentle? I think, 
gratitude, you know. Um, uh, oh, this is hard. Um, I think coming from such humble beginnings that, um, I don't know, I've always been really grateful for everything. And so, and I always consider myself a student. So, you know, you can't be a collaborator if you think you know everything. Then you think you're an auteur. You don't need to collaborate with anybody. But I always have always been so grateful for everything that's come my way. I had never knew any of this would happen. Um, and everybody that I got to work with taught me something, you know. And the only way that you can get them to teach you something if you give them the space to do it. And so that's what collaboration has always been to me. Let me throw my ideas out, let me hear your ideas, let me inspire you, let you inspire me. Let's work together because, you know, when you're working behind the scenes, this is what I always felt, when you're working behind the scenes, you're not the one who's ultimately out there in front of millions, billions, or five people. I don't care how many. The other person that you're working, that you're creating on is going to be out there. So I've always tried to say as well as not only the collaboration, but this is what I think works best for you. But it's your life. It's your career. You have to make the ultimate decision. And luckily, I, I don't... Even though I've been challenged, um, like with Madonna often, very rarely with Michael, but Madonna was always challenging me. Um, she always conceded at the end that what I had created was the best thing for her and it really worked. And I think I had the, that collaboration, especially from the Blonde Ambition Tour is what, and, and the Marie Antoinette Vogue, which Beautiful. I, you know, that just came out in Billboard as the, the most, the, the, the highest rated um, peak performance that's ever been performed on the Music Video Awards is uh, the priest, the Vogue Marie Antoinette that I created for her. I was when so excited. When they hit that fan, when they hit that fan, oh, <laughs> you hear it. I was like, oh my God, you hear that fan go, woof. I was like, ooh, ooh, she. And, She's and there's a, a moment monster. There. She is um, a monster. She well, just the three girls, the three ladies, flipped out when I said, "Okay, there's here." So you're going to have to flip the fan and catch it live on TV. They were so nervous about that one part when they all did it together and it worked, and they were like, "I could see it." I was out in the audience. I could see their faces go, "We did it! We did it! <laughs> oh my god! We can keep on going!" You know. Um, oh, yeah, I love that. Phew. Uh, that, 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 I mean, I, the, the whole piece is great, but that's like my favorite <laughs> thing. Wow. I'm like, oh my God, you a bad girl. Oh, yeah. But anyway, I, you know, I, I've always, you know, I, I've always been insecure going into anything. So I do a billion weeks of research. So I know more than I possibly have to know. Um, and so that I can bring something to the table, you know? And once I do that, I'm, I've never been good at improvisation. So when I fill myself up with knowledge and then I step into a room to collaborate, if something changes, I'm able to change it because I have options now. What's what Roy Linden uh, used to talk about. Oh. You do all your homework and then you throw it away. That's so exactly. when you do your homework, you are confident. And you can go any which way, and and I I want to um I, I want to spend a little time talking about Roy because oh. I used to love watching you work in Roy's class. What I did not know was that you were one of the people that encouraged him to start teaching. Yeah, yeah. How did you meet Roy? Well, what happened was there were two other women that lived, two women that lived in the small apartment building that I lived in, um, Wendy Winters and Ivana Chubb. And um, Ivana wound up being, I mean, they, they, had, they had a few other friends, you know, and they were all, we were all looking for an acting teacher. We wanted to have an acting teacher. And somebody, I don't know who, but somebody heard about Roy and they were a friend of Roy's and they had encouraged him 
I can't remember which woman it was, but they encouraged him to start teaching the class. I think and it was said, Ivana. I think Ivana. It could have been Ivana. Yeah. And he said, well, I don't have any place to do it. He said, I don't have an apartment that big. So it started out with like maybe eight, eight people. And we would go from one person's apartment to the next. Sal Viscuso was one of them. He's very successful. And Ivana now has one of the most successful acting teachers in, in the, the world. United States. In the yeah. world. In yeah. the world, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, and that's what happened. We just thought he started with us and built this regime that was fantastic for actors and just taught all of us, you including you, we learned so much from this man, so much from this man, not only about acting, but about life, you know. Um, there's one thing that I often tell people and I catch myself falling uh, falling into the wrong aspect of how to employ it. But, you know, Roy always taught us how to get what we wanted and to realize there's a thousand ways to get what you want. And you find yourself on the phone with those hideous people who work for AT&T and you're screaming and cursing and using every possible four-letter word you possibly can. And Roy London's voice comes into your head. You're not getting what you want. You're not getting what you want. So I often say, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm, I didn't, you know, you must have a thousand people calling you and they're all like me, complaining, complaining. And I don't mean to be complaining, you know, and I'm sure you're having a rough day and everything changes. You know, all of a sudden they love you and they're on your side. And I go, thank you, Lord. <laughs> well, well, it's his, his, his uh, motto, which was win. You know, how will you win? It's it's it, you, you did you did you win in the scene? Did you yeah. go did you go for what you want and did you win? Yeah. That yeah. it's that thing and and knowing that winning doesn't come. I, I don't remember what he he would say uh, uh, early on when I was taking away. He says you don't have to cry to get to get the audience with you. Yeah. Just tell us. Just tell us this. And I I always that resonated for me because I could cry on cue, oh. like not, not fake cry, but I could, yeah. I could bring whatever, uh, feeling I needed in order to get there really quick. Yeah. And so yeah. he said, hold it, hold that, you know, uh, try not to cry. And that was so, uh, such a powerful tool instead yeah. of don't try to cry, try not to, not cry. to cry. Now yeah. do the scene. Yeah. And the other thing that I I think was such a gift from Roy when he when he would teach you how to direct yourself. Where were you on, and where were you off? And you know that if you're really uh, paying attention and in tune with your body and what you're going for, you know you were committed you 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 weren't committed you were off you didn't work um you you weren't getting it you know you yeah. weren't getting it but um i could see and i could be wrong i could be putting my spin on you but i could see uh, it, it, throughout the book how you are speaking to them i could hear roy yeah i could oh, hear, yeah i could hear you well, what do you think how would you do this how is yeah. you know and it was it, it, yeah, yeah. He so was, many uh, lessons, so many lessons and so many tricks, you know. One of the other ones that I always loved and that I always use when I'm directing actors is, um, you know, what has happened a moment before? What happened a moment before this scene began? Where were you? What was going on? And when you stop and think that, it infuses so much into every single scene, you know. But, oh my gosh, he was just, I wish there was, I, I had a book of quotations, you know, because so many of them will come to my head and I know you and Susie says the same thing, you know, so many of his words still ring in our minds and in when so he many would, situations. When he would go off and talk about Langford, you, I, I, <laughs> when Langford, I was like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> Loved Roy boy. That was... <laughs> He was my papa. That no. way, I would, 
I would give him Father's Day cards and oh, tell him really? yeah, what a father that. he was. Because it was, oh. he was really like a father figure. At least yeah. for me, he he embodied what a good father was. You know, he was a, he was and even though he didn't have his own kids, we were his kids. He yeah. Was oh, yeah. So proud. Uh, I, I remember when you got uh, beat it, he was so proud. He was so <laughs> and and Maureen, Maureen and and, yeah, Smith, Maureen and yeah. you know, when when actors would get stuff that he saw you working so hard for that he was so cl uh, complimentary. Oh. It just it it you could see it filled his heart. Absolutely. Like he was like like these are my kids. These are my they're going out in the world and <laughs> they're doing they're doing it. So uh, uh, yeah, just uh it, and you're doing you're doing exactly what he would love. You know. So I want to get into your directing um because as you were choreographing you started to transition into getting into directing. How did that start for you? What what was the impetus that said, hey, I can direct this? Well, um, I was a director when I was in college. I had my own company. This was one of the reasons also that this gentleman, David Brubaker, wanted me to stay there because I was doing kind of alternative theater pieces that nobody else was doing. And, um, you know, so I'd already been a director on a small scale, a very small scale, but um, when I studied with Roy, I, I, I studied predominantly not because I really wanted to be an actor again, but because I wanted to be a director. And I wanted to learn how to really speak to actors in actor speak. And um, so, again, like I said, I knew that I would have to transition by being a choreographer. And I started by directing uh, uh, live shows, pop tours. Tours for Michael, tours for Madonna, the Blonde Ambition Tour, tours for Sheena Easton, for Donny Osmond. Um, you know, and, and, and that's how I began that kind of directing. And then I slowly started doing some little mini films. I would direct a small, small thing here and there. And then I started getting into commercials. And so I started directing commercials, which was really exciting for me. Um, and then kind of my big real step into the directing world outside of the pop world was when I did Dance in the Dark with Lars von Trier. And, um, you know, he invited me to do this and he invited me to be there as the choreographer. And at first, that's all I signed on to do. And then he decided he wanted to man the principal cameras for the actors. So that took a lot of his time away from the uh, mu musical elements of the show. And he said to me, look, you know, you're a director. Why don't you just kind of take over these things? And then I'll come in and we'll work together when it comes to the final shooting of things. But basically, you direct these pieces. You're going to choreograph them. And that's kind of, that was really my first real experience of having this and working. And, and, and the crazy thing was he was a, he was a nut. He was a fantastic <laughs> genius. Well, the fact he, that he, he, he told you a hundred cameras. Uh, a okay, a hundred little cameras. Yeah, yeah. This size, you know, this size, a hundred. And sometimes more than that, because if we did something for a couple of days, he would say, okay, well, a hundred now, but, and then tomorrow you need to change 50. So change 50 cameras for, I, I, it was incredible. But that really, really, and I had done so many commercials with an amazing director, one of my greatest mentors, commercial director named Joe Pitka. And, you know, he taught me so much. I, I choreographed probably over 200 commercials for him. Wow. And he was such a collaborator. And he was also, also like Michael and Madonna, just gave me free reign. You know, he'd call me in and he'd say, hey, you make something happen here? Can you make something happen? I'd be like, sure, okay, great. You know? Well, because so, you were trustworthy. Yes, and he, and he trusted yeah, me. Yeah, you, you, tr you were trustworthy. He saw that that you could be trusted, you know, mm -hmm. that you were going to do the job and not, you know, you were responsible, you were trustworthy, you were prepared, you were committed, and you were disciplined. Absolutely. What a wonderful combination. <laughs> and I was fun to have around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, but I mean, isn't that what we want in collaboration? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. You you oh. don't want people who are going to become Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. They come in one way, they leave out another. Or egomaniacs that have no room for any other person's creativity. You know, so, but so these, this this was kind of this was the way I I began to work, and and so from that, you know, um, working with Lars, I really got the confidence to step into bigger commercials, and then I was invited to direct an opera downtown LA Opera, and Placido decided he would conduct, and I created a piece for. Manon for Anya Netrebko, Rolando Villasson, and um, that was a huge success. And, you know, and then I just started directing other things. I directed Cabaret, which is next year. It's coming into the 20th wow. year. 20th in year. Germany, in Berlin. Berlin. Yes. In Berlin, where the musical is set. Yes. So that was so exciting. And they originally called me in to choreograph it because they had seen my work in Dancer in the Dark. And I said, when they invited me to come, the theater was a beautiful little Spiegel tent. Um, oh my gosh, from eight, 1918. And it was exactly like the time period of cabaret. And uh, it all fit so beautifully together. I saw it in my head when I walked through those tent flaps. And I said, guys, I would have to direct the show. I can't just call it rapid. I would have to direct it. And... It took a week or so, and then they came back around and they said, okay, we want you to do it. And so evidence that I think I did a good job is that next year's 20th anniversary of it in, in Berlin. The first several year, first five years, it ran all year long. Um, now for the past uh, 16, or no, 14, it's run from uh, early July to October. It's become a big summer regular event in Berlin, and that's so exciting to me, so. Yeah, there are so many layers to this book, but um, um, what I loved was your sense of negotiating for better, like early on getting credit when they weren't giving credit to choreographers, you know, um, teaming up with a dancer who became an agent and then pushing for stuff. Because when you started, it was kind of like the wild, wild west. It's oh, yeah. kind of like it is right now. <laughs> on a different level, you yeah, know, different. in that uh, dancers had no say, they had no protection, they had no representation, uh, none, none. And and so you really, you know, because we can talk about people who are creative, but then they have no business sense. And what I really appreciated in reading uh, the book was you you do have a business sense that just like you said to the people in Berlin, I have to direct this, it, that you you were confident enough and courageous enough to say what you wanted. After things began to take off, after I, I, I danced successfully and I began to choreograph and stuff, I realized that in a way, until I got to that negative point, which I lost all perspective about when I was in Santa Barbara, that- um, Just for a minute. <laughs> Just for a quick minute. Till the ice cooled you down. <laughs> Til the, uh, yeah, exactly. It's room service. That's room right. service. Oh, my God. Um, but, you know, I, I realized that I had a really tough childhood. And not just me, my whole family did. And I thought, you know what? Nothing can be as bad as that again. You know? I mean, it, it's all my life now. It's not me being subject to other people's lives. and and them determining what's going to happen to me. It's all about me and my choices. And, you know, and I saw in front of me that when you made the positive choice, when you acted from your heart, when you acted without anger, when you acted without negative ego, because I think that ego is very important for us to have as artists, but when you use it abusively, it's very destructive. And... I realized all those things. I don't know how, Lydia. I really don't. Other than I said before, gratitude. And well, I you showed up with love. Every, with gratitude and love. Yeah, because you are very, you know, that's God in you. It's the love in you that is like, I'm not trying to overstep anything here. I want to be a collaborator. That's God. You know, that, that mm. we are little creators. Mm. And, and when, we, when we align ourselves with God, 
it is like the creativity flows. So mm. you you've always been tapped into the big creator to allow you to create all these um, iconic pieces. Because I, I think there are you know there's a million choreographers, there's a million directors, but the ones who rise up, my sense is that they they're tapped into a higher power. Mm. You know that they're like, okay, flow through me. I don't know what we're doing. So flow through me. Absolutely. That's what I say in my book. I say that, you know, I feel like I, in moments, I, I stick my finger into the electric socket of creativity and it all just comes through, you know, and I, I don't understand it at first, <clears throat> but when it all falls into place, it seems to be something that is me, but something that's gone through me, you know, so I totally agree with what you say. And, and so I, I want to now kind of shift in you coming uh, into yourself at a young age and realizing, hey, I'm a, I'm a young gay man. This is who I am and not making apologies about it and how maybe still today, but early on, it, it kind of bit you in the butt a lot of times. It, it did with Shirley MacLaine, it did, you know, because here's this great looking guy. And I, I'm sure Shirley wasn't the only one that saw you as a lamb chop, but um, but that there probably was a lot more women who saw you like a lamb chop with a little a little mint jelly on the side. <laughs> that, that, and and how pissed off, I bless you. <laughs> how, how, pissed you. off how pissed off they get. Damn, what you know. She, oh. she was abusive. I mean, she, <laughs> you know, it was like she was abusive about it. Um, but that here you're coming into yourself at a time when, first of all, gay people are not really treated well. I mean, they're still not treated well, but but back then they really were treated well. And Absolutely. then and then to add to that, we now have the AIDS epidemic which um, this this epidemic then isolated a lot of gay people because the media was saying it's a gay disease Absolutely. and we're losing people. We're losing so many creative people that uh, I, I want to know what that period was like for you. I mean, I, I read some stuff in the book and it, it, it um, you know, we lost Ray. I mean, we lost uh, Roy to AIDS and that was devastating for me. It was like, my papa is gone, you know? And it was like, what? And not to mention all the hundreds of amazing artists that we lost who yeah. died in shame because yeah. it was treated not as a disease, but as something shameful. Absolutely. Which is the worst. It, it, that to me is the crime, not, not the, not the disease, but the mistreatment of people who had the disease. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was devastating. It was frightening to be a, a gay man during that whole epidemic. And, um, you know, uh, I was in a relationship, so I was fortunate that, you know, I, I kind of wasn't in situations that made me vulnerable to that, thank God. Um, <clears throat> but I lost so many friends. I lost so many dancing companions, uh, you know, it was like being in a war. It was like every week you'd know somebody else died, you know, and did you hear so-and-so died? Did you hear so-and-so died? Did you hear so-and-so has died? Um, it was devastating. It was like something that I, I pray we never have to go through again. You know? um, it was so interesting with the COVID situation that- Well, we it, went through it with COVID, but but a little the, different. But. A little different, but but we lost so many people because they didn't heed the warning. They yeah. they were lied to. They were told this was not a big deal. It was going to go away, and we lost a million people when it it could have it could have been avoided early on. And all these people that believed in the lies. Yeah. Um, I so I, I don't okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right. another whole conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, it was very difficult. It, it was very devastating. And, um, you know, especially you would go to jobs and, you know, there was always a, a, a small 
coterie of dancers, working dancers in LA. And you were used to seeing the same people on every gig and you, you would go and so-and-so wasn't there. Oh, how come you didn't, you're not, didn't you hear? You know, and it was horrible. It was like, I remember um, for the Vietnam War, I was in college and they had a lottery um, <clears throat> rather than a draft. And I remember sitting in the, the hub, which was the little cafeteria there, with so many of my friends, and you would hear these numbers called out like bingo over the loudspeaker, and it was your birthday, and if it was your birthday, like they would say, okay, number one, and then they'd give number two, and they'd go through the year, 365, and if you were up in that, under that 100 number, you were pulled out of college and sent to Vietnam, or you left the country, or you did something, so I was very fortunate, I was 276, I'll never forget. You know, but it almost felt like that with the AIDS epidemic, you know, just because you were a gay man, you were afraid of everything for a while, you know, as I panicked at the beginning of the COVID situation. I mean, I would watch, wash every single thing I would bring home from the store in bleach. And, you know, I was just incredibly uh, profuse in the way that I would put my attention to every single thing to make sure everything was clean and and nothing was going to happen, and nobody would be infected, and, and all of that. And thank God, I've still not had COVID. So, nor Renee. We've been Me very either. Good for you. Yeah, yeah we Good we mask you. up. We have our little yeah. sanitizer. We wash yeah. our hands. We are, yeah. you know, I, I haven't really been in many large crowds since COVID started. Uh, I've uh, had to get on planes and. I, I'm covered, it, you know, Me too. it's like, oh, no. And and I think, you know, I, I think it's it's an invisible disease, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. you can't, yeah. it's not like you can go, okay, don't go over there. It's, yeah. you don't know who you're talking to, what, you know, so you have to, you have to be careful. And hopefully, hopefully it will become like a little comic cold where, where, yeah. you know, we can, we don't have to be wearing the mask, but I'll tell you one thing, since wearing the mask, I haven't gotten colds. I haven't gotten flus. I haven't. Nothing. Nothing. Isn't that amazing? Same thing for us. Yeah. That's amazing. We've so been it's very healthy. Yeah. And all it takes is putting on that little mask that every, that, that half the world used to make fun of Michael Jackson for wearing. And because he, he didn't he want to He was ahead of his time. He you know, was. But that's very Korean. Um, oh, yeah. uh, before, before the, <laughs> before the pandemic started, I, I, I'm really big into watching Korean shows. And so they would have the mask. And I remember getting on a plane one day and, and cause I would get cold on the plane. And yeah. I remember I, I said, I need to go buy, I need to get one of those masks. And I bought them just before the pandemic started. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Because I. I remember getting on the plane and there was a, a Korean girl in front of me and she was masked up and I said, I got to get one. Of those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they, but they were very big wearing, you know, I'm sure maybe other Asian countries, but I yeah. started to see it in, in, uh, the South Korean, uh, uh, K dramas. So wow, it's, uh, wow, yeah. Wow. So I, I want to ask you, uh, uh, two other questions because okay. uh, there's so much I can ask you, but <laughs> I, I saw that um, in your, in your website, you have um, Cirque du Soleil Elvis. You worked on that. That was. Yes, I did. Um, I, I wrote it and I directed it. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. And it was not a great experience for me. Um, I didn't really, I mean, I, I like the create. The, the original creative process of putting it together and collaborating with artists of all different kinds and just amazing talents I had never experienced before. Physical talents, Not a, I'm not talking about the set designers and stuff, but I'm talking about the, the artists themselves, the performers. Incredible, just an incredible education. But then what happens is, <clears throat> what happened on that and on a lot of surf projects, I don't know what it's like anymore. Um, the people who own surf come in and they start changing everything on you and you have no contract that says they're not allowed to do it. So they take a show that you've worked on for three years and they come in and they go, my daughter doesn't think that the dancing is so good. She doesn't, it was all about Elvis Presley and I hired a wonderful choreographer, Bonnie Story, to choreograph it and it was fantastic, I thought. Well, 
one of the owners of Cirque came in to watch part of the show once we got to Vegas and we're putting it up with his daughter and we have a meeting after and he said, um, my daughter thinks that the choreography should be hip hop. So we're firing your choreographer. And, you know, and then they start changing it and they bring in people and they change my concepts and they change, but I'm not the only one. So many people fall to that situation with Cirque. Um, but I had a great time and, and I learned a lot from it. I didn't include it in the book because I was fortunate enough to have a documentary done about my work. Oh. Yeah, it's called The Man Behind the Throne by a Swedish choreographer uh, director. And, um, and where Chester can King. we find this documentary? Well, I, I think it's on YouTube. Okay. I'm not, yeah, I'm not quite sure. All right, if it is, I'll put it in the description. Okay, and it's called The Man Behind the Throne. And it basically, it, it's about my career up to that point, uh, which was 12 years ago, a lot of things included in it, 15 years ago now. And, um, but it, 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 the through line is the creation of the Elvis show. So that's why I didn't include it in my book because oh, okay. it was already kind of used and exploded in, in documentary, so. And but, I saw, uh, there's a picture with you and Sheree Adams. Oh yeah. I love Sheree. Oh, she she's was one my, of my teachers. Uh, she really? well, I uh, she was doing a class on one person shows. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I was wanting to do a second one person show, and I got to work with her, and then she kind of helped me um, shape my original show. I love her. I think she is so smart and oh. such a great drama uh, dramaturge, and I just love her. She's such a dear friend. Well, I put her in the Elvis show. Originally, I wanted to have these short little scenes and I cast her as Elvis's mom and she was fantastic. But this is one of the things they did. They said to me, I hope I had maybe five mini scenes that lasted at the, one minute at the most. And they were informative biographically. And they also enhanced the performance that you're going to see next, rather than it just be a performance, it had a relativity to the situation and the story of Elvis Presley's life. And this was something that they decided, no, we don't want we don't want any talking in a search show. So anyway, they kicked out my my uh, Colonel Parker and they kicked out my young Elvis Presley and they kicked out my Gladys Presley. Um, but Shrey and I have worked together for a long time. Um, she assisted me on a fantastic project I did down at the Shrine, uh, a, a two evening event, and, and we just had the best time. But we just we, we just saw each other like last week. And, oh. Um, oh yeah, we see each other all the time. She's, she's amazing. I love she's her. She's such a sweetheart, so yes, talented. She's In amazing. so many ways. And so such talented. a kind person. Oh, so such good. Such a kind person. What? would you like to be doing in the next few years? Is there something you haven't done yet that, cause you've done so much, but I know there's a lot more in your brain. Well, actually there isn't, um, you know, I, I've been working, I've been fortunate enough. I, I directed the musical Evita in Vienna about eight years, nine years ago, I guess now. And they brought in an independent producer, a man named Willem Metz from um, Holland. And we got along famously. And when that concluded, he said, listen, I've got a baby that I'm working on here and I've been working on it for a little while. I've got a writer and I've got a director, I've got a writer and a composer and I would like you to direct it. And I said, okay, well, call me when it's time to do it. And he goes, no, I'd like you to come in now. So I've been working on this project, which I can't really talk about too much, um, but it's a, it's, it's the, modernization or the semi-modernization of a Chinese legend. And we've been working on it for a long time. And as a director, you're rarely ever pulled into the creative process until it's ready to be put up on the boards. So it's been such an interesting um, experience to be pulled in from the beginning, from the inception and, and spend time with the composer and spend time with the director and them relishing the collaboration as much as I do and, and, and loving my suggestions too. So it's been an absolutely incredible experience, but I thought that it was going to be going up either this year or next year. Uh, I directed a, a reading for backers, one in Amsterdam uh, in last fall, and then one in London in March. And now we have some possibilities, but yesterday we had a, 
gathering for the first time in several months. And Willem told us that he doesn't think that this is going to happen until maybe 2025, maybe the beginning of 2026, it will go up. And I was kind of very disappointed because, to be honest with you, Lydia, I'm, I'm kind of ready to stop. You know, I mean, I've been so fulfilled. I've done everything more than I ever imagined I could do. Um, you know, I, I've enjoyed being at home. I'm enjoying being in my garden. I've been enjoying, you know, having a husband and a dog and taking the dog on a walk every day. And, you know, things that real people do that, that for so many years I never had the opportunity to do, either because of the work or because of the pressure of trying to find the next thing to do, you know. But I'm, you know, I, I'm hoping, I mean, if something else happens, I have a meeting next week with Pasadena Playhouse. Who knows, you know, I mean, I'm always open. But um, if nothing happens other than this one musical, I'd be content. I'd be content, you know, spend a little more time with the people I love. How do you fill your creative well when you're not working? Well, I read. I'm a voracious reader. Um, and my garden, you know, I, I, my garden has saved me throughout this entire career because, you know, you can imagine when you're working with people who are at the pinnacle of their career and you're responsible for keeping them there, um, it's a lot of pressure. So the beautiful thing was I would come home and I would take a yard that was just dirt when I moved in and create gardens, not food gardens, but um, beautiful drought resistant gardens. And, um, and I did it and all my intention, all my focus was on giving life to the plants. And I continue to do that. And I work in my garden almost every day. And it gives me such joy, that and my dog and my husband and traveling. And we have a, you know, we've been checking off bucket list things. And a couple of years ago, we went to Thailand and that was phenomenal together and Taiwan. And, and then in November, we're going with the woman who would direct the documentary and her husband, they are uh, teachers at the University of Stockholm. They teach film, various uh, elements of film, and they work with the University of Cairo. We saw it on Facebook and we said, hey, you go to Egypt? That's on our bucket list. And they said, let's make a plan. So that four of us are going to Egypt for three weeks in November. That's beautiful. And, um, this, yeah, it's those kind of things, real people things, going to visit my family, going to see my mom, take care of my mom. And, yeah, it's those are the things that I love to do right now. So I've given so much and I've received so much from the entertainment business, but I'm in the day no more of that and, and grateful. What have you learned from your garden? How, cause, cause gardening I think is, is a teacher. Patience, patience. Oh yeah, patience. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the big thing that I learned from the garden is patience. <laughs> Last question. What do you want your legacy to be? I would hope that people would say I'm a kind man and that I'm a generous, with a generous heart. That, um, that I've tried to bring some good to the world. And you have. That's what I hope. And you have, and you do every day, and you are such a joy. And I am so uh, honored that I no, get to call you my friend. And, no. and through your book, I got to no. learn so much more about you and, and just uh, deeper stuff that I did not know. No. Um, and, and how much our backgrounds are similar. Yeah, so, so, uh, <laughs> so, so much. I, I just love you so much. I, oh, I, here. you know, I'm so grateful, first of all, for Susie, because that is my friend from another mother and I would do oh, yeah. anything for her, but <laughs> uh, anything, um, I, whatever, if she calls, whatever, I'm there. It's like, let's go, let's go. And so, and because of her, I got to, uh, embrace another family, including you. Uh, including her mom and dad, yeah. you know, including Danny. So I am just so grateful, including Marilee. I am so grateful um, that that you're, you know, that we're we get to live life in close proximity. So thank wow. you. Well, I want to thank you for not only this, but for 
for really enjoying my book so much, you know, and, and being in this business for as long as you have and being part of it, you know, that that's a high compliment. That's a major compliment. You know? What else are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> what else are we going to do? <laughs> Oh, so the book is coming out in Spanish? Uh-huh. How Icones is... and Instintos. Yeah. I love Icones it. And Instintos. I yeah. love it. I love it. I love it. And and it also has to come out in German because of your Cabaret all your work in, in in Germany. Yes, it has to come out in German as well. Just tell that to the I publisher. So. <laughs> and hopefully they'll let you do a version where you read the book. I wish it had happened. So um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the publishers to even have taken an interest in and pushed it. Yeah, no, it's a great book. We love this book. Please, <laughs> please go to Amazon. Vincent Patterson with one T. <laughs> one T, people. One T, not two. One T. So we just want you to oh, know wow. that. So. Oh. If you are an actor and you want to level up your game and you want to have some of what Vincent brings to the table, um, I have a book called Acting Smarter Planner. My Acting Smarter Planner is a perfect book to help you navigate this business. And I also have a program to help you to, to be able to um, fill in the blanks as as an actor who needs help with your business, you know, wow. uh, it just gives you a lot of tidbits on what you should be doing, how to help you, how to get you to where you want to be. As artists, we know how difficult it is. We know how challenging it is. But if you have a game plan, if you are prepared, if you do your homework, if you research, if you know what you want, you are intentional, you visualize, you are going to have that wonderful career. You just have to put in the work. This is not a um, lotto. It's not a winning ticket here. If you do the work, you will yield the fruit of your labor. So you can go to actingsmarternow.com. You can check it out. The book, the planner, the bundle. It's in English and the book is in Spanish as well. So, yes. So we say, come on. And until next time, 